I'm going to talk in the next 20 minutes about novel drug delivery systems. So what are the novel drug delivery systems? Why uh, you are hearing a talk with such a funny title today? Um, and why do they matter in HIV treatment? So we are going to talk about novel versus conventional in general in medicine, but also we're going to talk about novel within the HIV uh, treatment. So the drug delivery is the method of administering a pharmaceutical compound to achieve a therapeutic effect. That's the uh, definition. And uh, in HIV, we are used to oral method of delivery. Okay, so we, you know antiretrovirals are pills. That's the delivery of the drug. Now, the other conventional delivery drug systems are a sub, a buccal, sublingual, rectal, intravenous, subcutaneous, and intramuscular. So subcutaneous, some of us, the older ones, know that there was uh, a subcutaneous delivered uh, antiretroviral, which is uh, 220 or Fusion, which unfortunately was very difficult to deliver because it was twice a day um, administration of, of a subcutaneous injection. But I think that for some people it did a lot. It was very effective. And uh, intramuscular delivery also. So intramuscular delivery in medicine is actually a conventional drug delivery system. But for HIV, I think we can consider it quite innovative because again, today, where we are prescribing and administering pills. So let's talk a little bit about the intramuscular drug delivery. So there are some advantages of giving drugs intramuscularly. The drug is absorbed slowly and has a prolonged effect. So I promise I won't bore you too much with the pharmacology, with the PK of drugs. But if you look at what happens with the green line when you give a drug every day, you have a peak and a trough, a peak and a trough, every 24 hours. If you give an injection of a long-acting agent, you might be giving in the injection once every month or every two months to achieve and maintain the same exposure. So in, that's, that's a good advantage. You can forget your pills and just have the injection when you need it. Uh, so there is a sustained exposure over time. Now, the intramuscular has... Uh, a bit of an advantage in terms of volume of drug compared to subcutaneous. is a larger volume of drug. We're going to talk a little bit about intramuscular and subcutaneous differences. And you bypass first-pass metabolism. So although we shouldn't think that there are no drug-drug interactions if we administer antiretrovirals intramuscularly, there are less because all of those that happen at the level of the gastrointestinal tract that were mentioned by Heather earlier and Laura earlier, so all of those that involve drug absorption are gone because you are giving the drug in the, mus in the muscular mass. There are some disadvantages, so it's an injection, so it's an invasive method of drug delivery, and the patient may experience discomfort, it may cause irritation, inflammation, and may require training. And this is really important, I think, for nurses and pharmacists that are going to be in the field over the next few years, because this is going to happen. And training, I think, is one of the keys on how the intramuscularly administered uh, drugs are going to be uh, implemented. So why am I talking about this? We're talking about this because we have phase 2B data from the latest study that is now published on the Lancet. They show that if you give cabotegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, and rilpivirine, which is an, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, together intramuscularly, they work as well as standard triple therapy. They compared it to abacavir, lamivudine, and cabotegravir oral. And you can see it from the graph there. So the first six weeks were oral leading period because this is, for the moment, is studied as an optimal maintenance treatment. So to maintain an undetectable viral load after an undetectable viral load is achieved from oral therapy. And you can see that the percentage of subjects that achieved an undetectable viral load at week 32 and 96 is quite high when you give the injections every two months, the Q8 weeks, 
the injection every four weeks, so every month, versus the oral administrations of the drugs. So it works. And what do patients think? Because this is really important. It's easy for me that I love, as Jonathan said, pharmacology and drugs to say, this is great, everybody's going to have injections. Someone might say, excuse me, I love my pills, I hate needles. So it's really, really important to understand what our patients want. And I think that will also be part of the training. So as part of the latte study, keep in mind the latte study is a phase 2B study, so it's quite small, but as part of the latte study, they produced data uh, based on patients' reported outcomes at week 96, and they uh, asked people if they were satisfied with their injections versus oral, and whether they would be satisfied to continue to receive an injections. To, con uh, to they be satisfied to continue to receive their antiretrovirals as in injections. And you can see that they, they're very satisfied, the orange bits are very, very high. And, the, the, and in terms of continuing, people on the oral treatment were quite tired at 96 weeks and bored already thinking, oh, maybe the injections did better. Uh, and, and so in, people who were enrolled in the latte studies were very happy with the injections. Now, what is going to happen? There are phase three study that are underway and they're looking at monthly or bimonthly injectables containing two antiretrovirals, which are cabo cabotegravir and ripivirin, which will lead to approval of this combination of drug administered intramuscularly within a year and a half, probably, FDA approval. And uh, they're looking at it for, as a maintenance uh, antiretroviral combination. And this is in the context of treatment. Now, these uh, agents, in the absence of a vaccine that can prevent HIV infection, are also studied as PrEP, in particular cabotegravir is uh, being looked at uh, on its own and uh, the, it's being developed again every month or every two months as a prevention tool for HIV because data from uh, animal models are very, very promising that cabotegravir is highly affected as a PrEP agent on its own. So that's where we are today uh, with the injections. Now, I just wanted to cover a little bit on a little bit of science. So there are some exciting uh, aspects of this new kind of drugs. So keep in mind that we are focusing on the delivery, but it's also important what the drug is. And some of these agents to be able to be long acting agents are also nanoformulated and they're a little bit different. And uh, this paper, for example, which was published eight years ago, showed in dogs that rilpivirin, when it's given as an injectable, so a nanoformulated rilpivirin, accumulates very much in macrophages and in other white blood cells, which, as you know, it's really important because that is where HIV um, lives or is, is dormant, is stored, and it is in lymph nodes, as you know. The lymph nodes and lymphatic tissue is a very important sanctuary for HIV. So there might be some advantages of using this... Um, these agents uh, that I think are deserve, uh, deserve to be studied. And, and this is just an example. We uh, performed a study a few years ago in Chelsea Westminster, um, and we looked at the, the concentrations of repivering in vaginal and rectal tissue. Still thinking about PrEP, but also HIV transmissions and, and treatment, if you, this is translatable to other tissues. And we saw that repivering concentrations accumulate and persist in tissues, both in vaginal tissue and in rectal tissue. Sorry, it doesn't matter. You can see this graph, this is not working. But uh, so that's, um, I, I think that's, again, something quite interesting and important when you're studying uh, a drug. 
So, it sounds all perfect, but it's not. We can do better than that. And this is what we've been talking in, within the HIV field for, for a while, um, and it's quite a hot topic. How can, so this is gonna be the innovative way of uh, delivering antiretrovirals, how can we even improve? And we, there are some drawbacks of injectable cabotegravir and repivering. So, first of all, at the moment, uh, there's a high dosing volume. So uh, if it's uh, an injection every month, it's more than three meals, so it's quite a lot. Uh, there is an extended pharmacokinetic tail. So what does it mean? So if you remember the graph with the red curve, the, the drug persists for a long time, which is fantastic. Let's imagine, imagine that we can actually give the injection every two months. After two months, your patient has to come back to the clinic because you have to give the other injection. If that doesn't happen, there is still drug there. HIV will start replicating because although the drug is there, there's not enough to inhibit viral replication and resistance to the drug will be developed. In the context of PrEP, similarly, you know, you will, people will be infected by HIV in the presence of an antiretroviral, so there'd be, the infection will happen. PrEP would not be enough anymore. And, uh, and the, the resistance can be developed. This has been shown from animal studies, so it has been proven that it's possible. So we are changing the focus of adherence to your daily pills to adherence to your monthly or bi-monthly clinic visit. So th th this is something very important. Otherwise, it's, we're gonna create problems rather than resolve them. The deliverability of injections is resource intensive. Again, so we're seeing people every six months now, if they're well, this is gonna be every, every month or every two months. So there's a big change that needs to be implemented together with the injections. There's still gonna be an oral lead period. And this could be a problem to implement this globally, I'm just saying, but you know, ideally, if you want to have an injection, you just go for it. But let's not forget, so the FDA requires that if someone go, wants to go for injectable, actually has the antiretrovirals as a neural antiretroviral for six weeks in case there are some um, re allergic reactions to the drugs. There's still some interactions, so uh, both cabotegravir and, re and uh, repivering, although they're administered intramuscular, uh, interact with uh, rifampicin. So globally, from a TB um, co-infection point of view, the problem is not resolved. And then um, cabotegravir, we need to see, but definitely repivering are characterized by a low genetic barrier. So there's better drugs, hopefully, uh, will be available in the future. So having, without taking anything away to this incredible, innovative idea of developing injectable antiretrovirals, and uh, th these are the first one, and they're not perfect. So what's next? So there are a few things that worth, it's worth mentioning today. So one is that you can actually, again, change the formulation of the antiretrovirals, so nanoformulate the drug, and you can give them as a pill once a week, this has been looked for dolutegravir, rilpivirin, and cabotegravir by this group from Harvard University. So they looked at giving the drugs either together or on their own. This is animal studies. But again, you can see that what we are applying is the same concept where if you look at the black uh, dotted line, you take the pill every day. You, that's the concentrations you achieve. But if you look at in red, you can take your pill, one pill once a week, and that's the drug concentration you achieve, much easier than taking them every day. So that's a method. There are new drugs in the pipeline. Uh, one of them is the NRTI EFDA that is being developed by Merck. So this is the history of NNRTI, starting from AZT to where we are today. This is slightly different mechanism, as you know, NRTIs are pro-drugs. They need to enter cells, be phosphorylated, and they're uh, uh, active against HIV when they're three for, B or three phosphorylated. And they, um, the half-life of the drug, of the active drug, is very long. And drugs like EFDA have a half-life of more than a week. 
So again, you can give one tablet once a week because it, it, it would achieve the optimal concentrations to inhibit viral replication in combination, obviously, with other antiretrovirals. So that's another method that it's worth mentioning in terms of giving less frequently drug, uh, drugs less frequently. Uh, there are some novel class of drugs that have been shown to achieve high concentrations and, um, and these concentrations persist above the EC50, EC95 for a long period of time. An example is uh, the uh, capsid inhibitor, the GSCA1. This is uh, the concentrations in rat when uh, following a single subcutaneous injection, the concentrations are maintained again well above for more than 10, 10 weeks. So this is being studied and again, it would be great to combine this to another drug that uh, can provide the same uh, exposure effect. And next, uh, which is uh, very exciting, is uh, implants. So this paper reports the um, idea of, the, uh, of a tunable, biogardable, thin film polymer devices, long acting implant delivery of TAF for HIV PrEP. Okay, so this is an example. There's few studies and few groups that are looking at that. And as you can see, it is a very small 2.5 millimeters diameters and 40 millimeters long. Uh, it's loaded with the drug that is released very slowly. And this would be an implant that would prevent HIV infection. And they're looking at some implants with an offering also for treatment and so on. So I think that is would be the, innov the real innovative delivery uh, of, of antiretrovirals and it's being studied. So just to summarize a little bit the pipeline, so again, although we, in medicine, as I said, intramuscular injection is still conventional for us in HIV, I think it's very innovative. And as you can see, there's some antiretrovirals with long-acting potential that are being studied. So we mentioned the NNRTI ribavirin and the integrase inhibitor cabotegravir, which are being studied in phase three. The nucleoside nucleotide EFDA, and there's also uh, another one, a GS9131, which is characterized by a long half-life intracellularly. So it's a potential new drug that is uh, uh, being studied in phase one. Uh, we talked about TAF, about the implant, and the CASPIT inhibitor. Quite a lot of exciting stuff. Just to conclude, I, it's worth mentioning the broadly neutralizing antibodies because it's a, a, a big novelty in HIV uh, treatment and prevention particularly. So this antibody can block HIV viruses in uh, macaques. There are currently two large trials that are underway with the VRCO1 intravenously. So this is, would be very difficult to implement, but there are formulations that are looking at much lower concentrations, which could be given subcutaneously every six months. Now, the feasibility of manufacturing antibody at high scale and a reasonable cost is complex, but obviously if this is the future and it proves to be very effective, uh, it, it will be worth investigating. And at the moment they need refrigeration, so in terms of global implementation is something we need to think about. But it's, men it's worth mentioning, I think there's always one slide in this kind of talks in order to, be, to make sure we don't forget about this strategy. So in conclusion, I think that uh, there are several highly potent agents in the pipeline that have alternative delivery uh, methods of uh, antiretroviral treatment and prevention. There's some promising technologies, uh, bright prospects for very long-acting antiretrovirals to hopefully make the life of people living with HIV easier and make prevention uh, possible beyond having to take a pill every day. Uh, the ideally products uh, fit for implementation should be implementable not only in high-income countries but also in low-income countries, as you can imagine. So this is really important. And uh, this could be a keystone in controlling the epidemic, all of these new methods that are, uh, make HIV treatment and therefore task easier and prevention possible. Thank you very much.